I didn't push anything. Um, yeah, so, but there, there are definitely some things where, you know, I'll be able to give you data and it, all you're missing out on is the act of literally taking, taking a small syringe, putting it into a machine and pushing it down is the only part that you'll actually, that's a huge amount of modern OCHEM is using these complicated instruments um, to get, get you your data and then you have to interpret the data. So in that, that aspect of it, you're not gonna miss out on anything because it's all about interpreting the data. Um, and we're still gonna do with those labs. It's just gonna be the, um, you're gonna miss the hurry up and wait part of setting up a complicated glassware apparatus, getting it boiling gently, but not too hard, and then watching it boil for 45 minutes um, and then purifying it. Um, and that winds up being like the same procedure for almost every OCHEM lab with very few exceptions. It's either, um, it's either set up a reflux, which is basically a condenser that goes straight up and down um, so that it, as the reaction happens, as it's boiling off, your solvent recondenses and falls back down. So it's basically is to keep you from losing any, um, any solvent, um, but you just sit and let it boil and then take it and you get rid of all the impurity and that's your product. Um, so, and I'm still kind of holding off hope that we might be in a place by spring that we could do maybe one or two in-person labs to get you some of those basic lab skills that we're going to talk about in theory, but you would actually be able to do it in person, um, like a recrystallization or a distillation, just so you've seen it in person once as opposed to just in videos. Um, but again, it's, this is just a weird year and you know, nobody's going to hold it against you guys. If you haven't done, done a recrystallization in person before, that's something that if you need to do another recrystallization further on in your careers, you'll be able to learn from somebody who's done it before. Um, and it's pretty easy once you pick it up. All right, let's go back to talking about hybridization a little bit more. Um, and I mentioned this earlier today, but so let's look at this really, this fairly simple molecule here, um, which would be a, a carbocation. And this is the carbocation with the positive charge in, the, in that allylic position where it's adjacent to a pi bond. So what would the hybridization be on the two carbons in the pi bond? SP2? SP. Yeah, it should be sp2, right? You've got three electron groups. Um, and that last one, though, the carbocation, in order to get a positive charge on the carbon, that means that the carbon has to have access to only, only three electrons, right? So remember, if when we're doing the formal charge, we're counting how many bonds and lone pairs there are and comparing those electrons to the periodic table. So if carbon has as four bonds, let's just look at methane here. It's got access to, it has full valence and it has access to half of each of those. It owns half of each of those electrons, right? Pairs of electrons. So carbon with four bonds has a charge of zero. If you want to have carbon with a formal charge of plus one, you can't just on, on oxygen and nitrogen to get a formal charge of plus one, we just made it share more than it normally would, right? So like oxygen, when it's neutral, has two lone pairs. When it has plus one, we just stick an extra bond onto one of the oxygen, on one of the oxygen lone pairs and now it's sharing more than it wants to and it has a positive charge. We can't do that with carbon because it doesn't have any lone pairs. So if it's got a positive charge, the only way to draw that is it must have three, only three bonds and no lone pairs. So basically if carbon's got a positive charge, it's because it doesn't have a complete valence. It only has six electrons around it. And now in doing so, it, it controls, you know, half of each of those six, 
So it controls three electrons and it has four on the periodic table. So that gives it a positive charge. And what that means though, is that if it doesn't have, if it has an, um, if it's missing a pair of electrons, the, the P orbital that would normally be holding those electrons doesn't wind up hybridizing because there's nothing for it to hybridize. There's no reason for it to mix that P orbital in because remember the whole reason that these things hybridized was so that it could make more bonds because bonds are more stable than not having bonds. If you've got, a, if you've got an incomplete valence, you're not going to hybridize one of those orbitals because you're not gonna mix in a bond or an orbital that's not gonna make a bond. So the hybridization on a carbocation is gonna be sp2, potentially even sp, depending on, on what else is going on. Um, and that's actually what we see when we look at these orbitals. When we look at the orbitals, we'll go back to the screen share again, because these drawings are better than what I can do on the board freehand. Um, if you look at the, the electrons that are in the pi bond between the two carbons on the left, they both look like unhybridized p orbitals, right? And those unhybridized p orbitals that are next to each other in, in phase can overlap with each other and make a pi bond. Well, if this third atom has an empty p orbital that's not hybridized as well, it can, it can arrange that p orbital facing the same way. And instead of having just a pair of electrons in a pi bond that's limited to just being around these two carbons, you actually have three pi orbitals, p orbitals for those electrons to move around in. So in effect, what you can do is you can spread out those pi electrons into that, that empty orbital over here. And you wind up with something that looks like um, it's made a pi bonding orbital over all three of the carbons instead of being localized to only over two of the atoms. Right. And that kind happens, of like benzene, kind of like a benzene ring. And that happens because when you, the more you can allow electrons to spread out, the more space you can allow electrons in general, the more stable they are that's balanced out by the fact that they're attracted to the nucleus of every atom because a nucleus has a positive charge, which is why they tend to be at the bottom of that potential energy. Why the one S fills up before the two S is because of the attractive force of the nucleus on those electrons. But if all other things being equal, electrons are most stable when they can be spread out. So the more we can spread these electrons out, the more stable they will be. Plus this kind of allows this carbon that would normally have an empty spot in its P orbital actually gets some electrons a little bit. So it makes that carbon a little bit more stable too, because now that carbon can act like some of the time it's actually got a full valence. It can spread out that positive charge across the whole, the whole molecule as well. Um, and so, and that's, that's an example of what we call a resonance structure and that a resonance structure, basically, if you can take a Lewis dot structure, um, where you have two pos if you have two possible Lewis dot structures that are both meet our criteria, um, of using the right electron is right. Number of electrons is the most important. And after that, it's filling valences. And after that, it was keeping charges as low as possible. Um, this one, we don't have a choice. If we use the right number of electrons, we can't fill up all the valences, which means we have to have a charge on a carbon. But if we, we have two equally plausible Lewis dot structures for it, we could put a positive charge on the carbon on the left or a positive charge on the carbon on the right. And so what resonance shows us is that these Lewis structures actually wind up sort of averaging out together. You add up the possibilities and you wind up, it's similar to making a, a bonding orbital where if you have constructive interference where they overlap and have the right phase, then you wind up with those 
with the true orbital structure actually being kind of both of these at the same time. Um, and one way that it's, it's frequently drawn, and I should make a point of the way that this arrow is drawn, this arrow, OCHEM is when we're going to get really, really picky about how we draw our arrows. When you first learn chemical reactions, it was just an arrow, right? Show that a reaction happened. Then we said, oh, but equilibrium arrows are different. They mean something different, so pay attention to that. And then earlier today, I said curved arrows mean something different than straight arrows. This is your fourth type of chemistry arrow. Um, this is a resonance arrow. This specifically means only thing that's happening with these arrows is that you're moving electrons back and forth between these two structures. Um, and it, and even that is not the best way of saying it. I said exactly what I was going to tell you not to think about it as. Um, it's not like it flashes back and forth between these two possibilities. It's more like it's both simultaneously. Um, and so in, in quantum terms, if I took a coin and I flipped it and let it hit the ground, you could look at it and it could be heads or tails, right? And before I flipped it, it could be heads or tails. When, when it's in the air being flipped, is it heads or tails? Well, it's both, right? It's neither. And that's really what resonance is like. It's, it's not either of these. The true structure is not either of these. It's both of them. And that's what do you mean by average together? Exactly, Olivia. Yeah, the book, um, like this has always really tripped me up, but the book gave an example about like a peach and a plum, I think. And it was super, super helpful. There was like this okay. little blurb. So if you guys find that in the book, it like totally cleared it up for me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of, you know, fantasy monsters. And one, another book that I've taught from before said, you took a unicorn and a dragon, they're both imaginary. But if you average the unicorn and a dragon together, it might look like a rhinoceros, which is a real thing. So resonance is not, you don't have either of the imaginary cases, you have something that's halfway in between them, or that's some mixture of the two of them. Right, and so it's, we will frequently talk about moving back and forth between resonance structures, because what we'll find out is that, so this, this positive charge is going to be really attractive to anything with a negative charge or a partial negative that's going to, it's going to just be attracted based on positives or attracted to negatives. And so we will frequently draw one resonance structure that goes through a specific reaction. Um, but it's really, it's not like it settles on that's the one structure I'm going to be for this millisecond. Um, it's really all of them. And by, it's a little bit like letting the coin fall and hit the ground. You can get it to sort of behave like it's one or the other, depending on if you quote unquote observe it in the case in observing it in this case would be bringing in something with a negative charge that's going to be attracted to it. And that's one of those concepts that I know is weird and I didn't spend enough time on it for you guys to really understand. I want you to hear it now and then we'll go into that in more detail when we get into more reactions. Um, I just want you to let that marinate. So benzene, I, and I showed a, a picture that looked a lot like this the other day when we were talking about benzene. Um, it doesn't actually look like what Kukuli originally said. Kukuli originally said, okay, it looks like a combination of these two shifting back and forth really, really quickly, which was sort of like before we understood what orbitals was, this was our best idea for what resonance was. Because remember, this is all happening before Einstein and Bohr had, and, and Max Planck had done any of the research into the quantum. So they didn't even know what an orbital was at this point. Um, and yet still somehow Kukuli came up with this idea that it was shifting back and forth really, really quickly. Um, and so what that actually winds up looking like is you don't have a pi bond here and a single and a single bond on another carbon. You wind up having those that pi bond. We actually refer to it as the pi structure because all three of those pi bonds in benzene wind up averaging out together. They wind up all mixing in together as those electrons move in that circle. 
as they chase themselves around that ring structure. Um, and the, the Ouroboros example is really kind of a cool historical note. Um, the one that always stuck in my head though, when my teacher taught me this in uh, college was, um, he said, it's like six magical ponies chasing each other around a corral. And everything's just so happy and stable, um, no pun intended. Um, he actually probably did mean the pun and I never caught it until just now. Um, but you can basically think of it and when you have these, these con they call them conjugated pi bonds. When you have these pi bonds that are alternating, so pi bond, single bond, and other pi bonds, when they when they're, um, can alternate like that, that allows you to have these resonance structures where all you have to do is move a pi bond over one, one place. Um, so for instance, if we have our hexagon of carbons, if we have a pi bond, if we have alternating pi bonds, each of these pi bonds is next to another carbon that has an, S, that has an unhybridized orbital, right? These pi bonds represent two p orbitals that are unhybridized. So there's no reason why you couldn't just move these electrons over. And redraw this with all of the pi bonds shifted over one spot. And then from there, they could go do it again. So there's, they can just keep going through this cyclic structure where every single one of these carbons winds up being identical to every other carbon. And it's not like there's a single bond next to a double bond. It's, it's drawn like this for convenience sake, for having these alternating pi bonds. But what's more accurate would be like saying that there's one and a half bonds between each carbon. And so sometimes you see that drawn as a circle inside of a hexagon is representing that those, those electrons are all moving around. Or sometimes you will see it drawn with dotted lines. Between all of the carbons. Um, it's most common to just have it drawn as those three pi bonds. That's the easiest way to draw it. Um, but it's, it's not very accurate because it's not like those pi bonds are stuck in that one spot. They're constantly moving around. And that's why it's saying it's like a group of ponies that are happy just going around. Cause it's just exactly. Moving. They're moving okay. in a circle. They're chasing each other around. Everything is so happy. Um, and now you guys will also remember that analogy forever. My, my old, my old OCHEM instructor was, uh, he was an interesting dude. He used to say very, he would just throw out random things that made you want to know more about his life without any explanation. Um, like, you know, we were talking about this structure of tear gas versus pepper spraying. He says, if you ever have the chance and you have to choose between pepper spray or tear gas, take the tear gas. And he would just move on from there with no explanation. Um, and he was like 70 years old, but which we, we backdated him. It put him in, um, in University of uh, California, Santa Barbara in the 60s. So it's probably likely he was tear gassed at least once. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So we see these resonance structures primarily when it's going to allow us to spread out things that would normally be unstable. So the reason that benzene is more stable than we would expect is because if you break up any of those pi bonds, you don't have this nice cyclic structure anymore. You don't, you're taking two of the ponies away and putting a fence in between them instead. Um, if you take any of those pi bonds and break them, because you can't have a resonance structure with an sp3 carbon. An sp3 carbon already has full valences. So let me go back for a second. So if we have our, our happy ponies running around and you take two of those and you turn them into 
carbon hydrogen bonds. Well, now all of a sudden you can't do anything to resonate in a circle anymore. We broke up that, that circle because you can't have a resonance structure with involving these carbons because they already have eight electrons, right? If you took any of the electrons away from, from the carbon hydrogen bond to try and make it resonate, if we did something like, like that, we would actually break a bond between the carbon and hydrogen the car and the hydrogen would float away. And we can't move electrons towards the carbons that are sp3 because now that carbon would have 10 electrons. So sp3 carbons can't have any resonance. You, you have to have an sp2 carbon to have resonance. And so that that actually explains why benzene was so stable once they were able to add on that piece of um, hybridization in orbitals because that tells you it's really advantageous to keep this as a pi bond in order to get these things to continually um, resonate. All right, so here's our rules for drawing resonance structures and these all have a reason behind them they're not arbitrary rules um first is like we've mentioned before the electrons move so much faster than the nuclei we basically are going to say that the nuclei sorry i forgot to switch back here um nuclei don't move so you can only move electrons and we're also never going to break a sigma bond Sigma bonds are so stable that they're, they're not going to participate in resonance. There's a lot of good orbital overlap. And if you broke a sigma bond, you would actually break a piece of the molecule off, like I was just mentioning. So you can only move electrons, never break a sigma bond. If you do your resonance structures right, the net charge does not change you might move a charge from one place to another. You might make a positive charge and a negative charge, but they have to add up to the same overall charge before and after. Electrons only move one bond away. They can only move one, one bond at a time, but that can look like an electron is moving further than that if you've got a bunch of other pairs in between two two points on a molecule that are distant from each other, but it, it's always going to look like, okay, this pair moves over one spot and then the pair that was there moved over one spot and moved over one spot and moved over one spot. And it looks like you took a pair of electrons over here and moved it over there, but it's really the chain reaction of moving all of those pairs of electrons in between them. And the last, last example was what I was just talking about with the benzene. You can't move towards atoms that already have a complete octet. So you're still never going to give an atom more than eight electrons. And there is a clarification on that, it's unless it's something that has a d orbital involved, like so if sulfur is involved, then that gets a little bit hazy, but we're not dealing with anything beyond row two of the periodic table right now. So for now, that's a hard rule. If it's got eight electrons, you can't give it more electrons. So let's try drawing resonance structure for acetate ions. So anybody remember the formula for acetate remember from your polyatomics? Probably not because you probably learned it in a way that doesn't actually show the structure and therefore doesn't really make sense. Acetate, the way you guys learn it in Gen Chem, you usually learn it as C2H3O2. With a negative charge. That's not the best way of writing it. For OCHEM, we're never going to write it that way. We're going to write it as in the condensed structure, which is CH3CO2 with a negative charge. 
which makes that structure make a little bit more sense, right? With some practice, you probably, I could, if I told you to draw this as a, as a stable Lewis dot structure, you probably could have gotten to the right structure. But this is a much better way of communicating what that shape actually is. Which, if we draw out the resonance structure, or sorry, draw out the Lewis structure, winds up looking like this. So where is the, the Lewis, um, where is the formal charge on this one? If, if this is acetate ion with a negative one charge, one of these atoms has to have a negative charge on it. So how do we determine formal charge again? Something, it's either sharing more than it wants to be sharing if it's a positive charge or. Is it the top, is the double bonded, or wait, the single bonded oxygen? Yeah, it's the, gonna be oxygen's most stable. It's got a charge of zero when it's got two bonds because it has two vacancies on the periodic table, right? So oxygen with a full octet that only has one bond is not sharing as much as it normally would. So that oxygen has more electrons around it than normal, so it's got a negative charge. So then if we were going to draw the resonance structure for this, is there a way we can move these electrons around that's going to change make things more stable. How could we do that? We can't move towards, so sp3 carbons are out. So this is not going to be involved at all, right? Because you can't take any of the sigma bond electrons and move them because then it would break, break off a hydrogen. And you can't move any electrons towards this carbon because it's already got a full octet. So sp3 carbons, we can just ignore when it comes to resonance. This oxygen is technically sp3, but it has lone pairs. And those lone pairs can wind up interacting in a way. So if we, we said, okay, well, you can't move towards any electrons towards this oxygen, but those lone pairs could move towards this carbon, but not unless it, not if it has a full valence, right? So the first thing that would happen is oxygen is really electronegative, right? So it's good at pulling electrons towards itself. So this pi bond between the carbon and the oxygen, we, that oxygen might actually just pull the electrons away from the carbon, which would then leave this carbon with an incomplete valence, which we don't want. And so one of these lone pairs would move over. And so that keeps the carbon being neutral. The carbon keeps four bonds. This oxygen that was a negative one now has two bonds. So it goes to being neutral. And this oxygen that had two bonds is now one. So it has a negative charge. So our Lewis, our resonance structure here, and I'm going to redraw this one a little bit smaller. So these electrons are moving over, these electrons are moving up. And so our resonance structure would look like the CH3 is still going to look the same, 
And now we've got that oxygen, the top oxygen has three lone pairs. And the bottom oxygen is sharing as two pairs of electrons. So we just moved the negative charge. The negative charge was on the bottom oxygen. Now the negative charge is on the top oxygen. So it's gonna switch back and forth. And this might, remember when you first learned how to do Lewis dot structures, you may have had questions for things like nitrate and carbonate. Like, how do you know which oxygen gets the double bond? Well, the real answer to that was it doesn't matter because really all of the oxygens that are attached are gonna have kind of a double bond. RJ? Um, are those going to continually switch like the other example or do they just stay like that? Or is that just kind of like you're just showing that they're moving and that's how you would show that they're moving? So a, a little bit of, it's you can think of it like they switch back and forth so fast that you can't see them. Sort of like a, the other a good analogy for that is it's like a propeller on an airplane. When the propeller is not moving, you can tell where the, where the blades are, right? But as soon as it starts winding up and starts moving faster than 60 hertz, then it really, the propeller takes up that entire space. It's really all of those places simultaneously. So you, you can think of it as switching back and forth. It's really, it's both of these at the same time. Um, and that's one of the things that makes acetate stable. If you just tried to take a hydrogen off of uh, ethanol, say, which is of an alcohol. Alcohols are not very acidic. It's really hard to take that hydrogen off of an alcohol because you wind up with an, an oxygen that has a negative charge and no resonance. But if you have two oxygens attached to the same carbon, it's really acidic because you wind up making two resonance structures that are, you do have a negative charge on an oxygen, but it's split between two oxygens, which makes it more stable. Right, so both of these are going to wind up being equally likely um, in this case. And I just confused the heck out of my computer. Um, still working on getting this thing set up the right way. My old computer, if I shut off one of the monitors, nothing changed. This one, everything moves windows when I shut off a monitor. Um, so let's go back to screen share. So anything where we have a charge next to a pi bond, if you have two pi bonds that are adjacent to each other, it doesn't work with something like CO2. So CO2 has two pi bonds, but they're too close to each other. So for CO2, if we look at the orbitals for CO2, uh, we wind up making that's the one I want. Let's see if it's got one with more. I'll just zoom way in. If you wind up with two pi orbitals on the same Adam, so if we look at this one, the, the right-hand oxygen has its p orbital that's in a pi bond is going up and down in the plane of the board. But that means that the left-hand oxygen can't be up and down because this carbon only has, the p orbitals have to be 90 degrees from each other. You guys remember that they, we always said that they were following, the, there was one set of pi, p orbitals that went along the x-axis, one that went along the y-axis, and one that went around, along the z-axis. So they were always 90 degrees from each other. And so if you have the same atom, and you have two, a pi bond going one way and a pi bond that's 90 degrees from it, these two pi bonds can't overlap because they're 90 degrees from each other. So when we say you having pi bonds adjacent to each other, we mean basically one bond away, not attached to the same carbon. And if you remember back when we were talking about the nitrogen at the beginning on caffeine, and I said something like an atom can only have one pair of electrons resonating at a time, 
because that other pair of electrons has to be perpendicular to it. So you're never going to have a resonance structure that has where you've got um, more than one pair of electrons per atom at a time. And we'll see, see what I mean here in a second. So here's an example of first it just has you, the book actually follows a um, kind of warms you up by drawing the arrows for you. And you were just su supposed to draw the resonance structure that would be the result of those electrons moving. So this is pretty good practice. Um, and where I can and make the formatting work, I'm going to try to leave the numbers on these because the answers to these and step by step for similar examples are in the book in chapter two, right around where this problem is, which would be um, in the middle. I don't remember exactly what the page is, um, but it'll walk you through some of the logic for interpreting this. Um, but the big, if you already have the arrows drawn, it's just a matter of saying, okay, I'm breaking this pi bond and I'm going to move those electrons somewhere else, or I'm taking this lone pair and I'm turning it into a pi bond. So for A, that was the simplest version we, we started with. All you're going to do is you move the pi bond over to the other side. And then you're left with, you moved electrons away from that other carbon, the other carbon at the end. Sean, we can't see what you're doing. Yeah, I was going to do that here in a second. Um, I was letting you guys write down some of these structures first. So if we start from this structure here, pi bond adjacent to a positive charge, if we move the pi electrons over to the carbon with the positive charge, we're taking a pair of electrons away from this end carbon. The carbon in the middle is still going to have eight electrons either way. Right, but the carbon at the end, on the other end, now we've, we've filled that empty p orbital on the right-hand carbon, but the left-hand carbon is now missing a pair of electrons. Right, and so that meets that criteria. We didn't change the net charge. If you change the net charge, that means you either added or lost electrons somewhere. You didn't count your electrons properly you missed an arrow somewhere and then redrew it without those electrons. All right, so if it's a little bit trickier, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep walking you through, this problem is specifically only saying, um, you know, draw the resonance structure that would be a result of these arrows. I'm gonna keep walking you through the logic of why these arrows are there as well. Um, so you can see it as many times as possible. If instead of having a positive charge here, B on this problem says you have a negative charge on that carbon. And the way you get a negative charge on a carbon was not by having an empty P orbital, it's by having a lone pair basically, right? So it still looks like a carbon with four electron groups, except that one of those is not a bond. You're missing a hydrogen and it's just got a lone pair. So it looks a lot like a nitrogen would look three single bonds and a lone pair. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this case, we can't draw the arrow the same way because you can't move a pair of electrons towards a carbon that already has a full valence. So if there's a negative charge, you're not gonna move electrons towards the negative charge because what do electrons do to other electrons? push them away, right? So instead, you're going to move electrons, move that lone pair towards the center carbon. And the, 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 carb, or the electrons that were part of the pi bond on the left wind up moving over to that left-hand carbon. And so our, our resonance structure would wind up looking like we moved a negative charge over. So same net result as for A, we moved a charge 
we moved a charge from the right-hand carbon to the left-hand carbon, but the arrows are backwards. For A, you are moving towards that positive charge, that empty spot in the carbon. For B, we're moving a negative charge towards a carbon that has a pi bond and moving those pi electrons that were already there. So subtle difference, but it makes a lot of difference in terms of making sure you don't have more than eight electrons on a carbon. Let's, Sean, I got a yeah. question. So if there's ever, just if we're ever drawing it and we ever see a pair going towards the negative, then we know that we're wrong because there would never be a pair going towards there. So, well, you know me, I hate to use absolutes, like never. Yeah, okay, so then the, um, but no, I, I think you're right. You're, you're not going to have, it'd be very rare to have a resonance structure where you're going to move pi electrons towards something that already has a negative charge. If something's got a negative charge, it's already sharing less than it normally would. And so to give it another pair on top of that would be pretty unstable usually. Maybe if it has somewhere to move to beforehand, right, Sean, though? Yeah, so, so potentially if there was another spot that this, that this pair of electrons could move towards, if there was an, a larger molecule, you could potentially see something along those lines. Um, but in general, your first thought should be moving, moving the negative charge towards something else, not moving towards a negative charge. So I'll write C up here. So I don't have to switch back and forth again. So this is, this functional group is an ester. If you guys remember from your quiz, an ester is when you had this carbonyl carbon, or a carbonyl carbon oxygen double bond next to an oxygen that then connected to another carbon. Um, so this is what triglycerides are made out of. They're called ester linkages, where you have that, that three carbon structure that's then got um, an ester linkage to a long fatty acid chain. Um, so in this case, though, if we're just looking at these, um, at this resonance structure, the arrows are drawn for you already as, so if, the, if you've got a carbon here, that's got, you've got a carbon oxygen double bond and then a carbon oxygen single bond, this carbon is connected to two more electronegative elements, right? Which means there's a, there's a partial positive on this carbon, which means it's going to be attractive to electrons. So if one of those pairs of lone pairs from that oxygen move over, we can't just leave it there because that would make 10, 10 electrons around the carbon. So we have to make room for those electrons. And you could switch the logic even. You could, if you drew this arrow first, that makes sense too, because carbon double bonded to an oxygen, oxygen's trying to pull the electrons, right? Oxygen is really good at pulling electrons towards itself. And if it does it strongly enough, then that makes an open spot on this carbon here for these, this lone pair to move over. So the resonance structure would then look like a negative charge on that top oxygen. And then now we've got an oxygen with three bonds down here, right? We're drawing all of our lone pairs. This oxygen had two lone pairs and it was neutral. It gave one of those lone pairs, oh, moved it over to make this resonance structure. So this oxygen now has a positive charge. You've got an oxygen with three bonds, that's always going to be a positive charge. <clears throat> so we wind up making something that has charge. We started with something where all the atoms were neutral. We made something where we had charges, but the charges still add up to zero. We made a negative charge and a positive charge, but it still adds up to the same as where we started. <clears throat> 
And let's see what the next slide was going to be. That's, so we're going to start with doing more practice like this on Thursday's lecture. And then I'll, we'll work on recognizing certain patterns and deciding which of these is more likely. If, we're, if we go back to our dragon and our unicorn example for a rhinoceros, a rhinoceros, you could definitely make the case that rhinoceros looks a lot more like a unicorn than it does look like a dragon, right? So sometimes these resonance structures aren't equally likely. It's like flipping a, a trick coin where 90% of the time it comes up tails, but 10% of the time it comes up heads. Sometimes you can have res some resonance structures that are more stable than other resonance structures that are more likely, or they make up a larger percentage of the orbitals, of the orbital picture. And we'll talk about how we can judge which of these is most likely um, on Thursday. So for now though, we'll go ahead and, um, and end lecture today. So do come, so lab today, if I can bend you here for just another second. Um,